The brewing industry in 1900 was about 39 million barrels. Breweries at the turn of the century were operating at a pretty much unprecedented scale in terms of the size of their operations and uh, allowed them to produce very large amounts of beer very economically and efficiently. By the beginning of the 20th century, the most profitable breweries in the United States were Schlitz, Paps, Anheuser-Busch, and Miller. And they were all competing with each other to get bigger. But the brewing industry was about to be faced with problems a lot tougher than friendly competition. On May 7, 1915, the British ocean liner Lusitania was struck by a German torpedo, killing 1,195 passengers, including 128 Americans. This disaster would have huge ramifications for the beer industry. When the Lusitania was sunk by a German torpedo, what happened was German-American brewers were suddenly looked at incredibly disfavorably by this country. People looked at who was selling the beer and who was making the beer, and all the names, Anheuser, you know, Bush, Coors, Schlitz, Peels, Tromers, Schaefer, they were all German names. Americans boycotted everything German, including beer, which was branded Kaiser Brew after Germany's leader. Then on January 16, 1920, Prohibition went into effect, hitting brewers even harder. Prohibition actually kind of took the major brewers by surprise. They weren't prepared for it. Beer was such an important part of life that they never imagined that it would actually be outlawed. August Bush outlined the grim prospect with blunt realism. Gentlemen, our business as we have known it is ended. A lot of them uh, uh, immediately panicked and sought other means to try to stay viable during the, this period. They knew it would be repealed, they had no idea when. So in the meantime, the big breweries turned their attention to making other products to stay afloat. We went into about 26 different businesses. We made refrigerated cabinets, we made baker's yeast, we made malt syrup, we made ice cream. Anheuser-Busch entered the corn products field and soon its syrups, starches, and dextrins appeared on the market. And then there were the do-it-yourself prohibition products. Some of them started making malt extract. So here they were in the brewery, they're making malt extract, putting it in cans and jars, it's then going home and people are making beer out of it. You would get a brick of malt sugar, and basically it came with instructions. Whatever you do, don't take this brick and melt it in water and boil it for an hour with uh, these hops and certainly don't put this yeast into it or an intoxicating illegal beverage may result. So beer making didn't go away. Not quite anyway. Prohibition did allow for at least some alcoholic content in beverages. It set the alcohol limit at one half of one percent. With those limitations in place, many brewers began making a product called near beer. Near beer is a wretched concoction. Uh, produced by uh, going through the first part of the brewing process and then stops that fermentation through various means. You end up with a fairly insipid, of course, weakened alcohol, not all that pleasant uh, beverage. Anheuser-Busch had Bevo. A new non-alcoholic beverage was introduced and instantly became a popular favorite. Bevo. Miller marketed Vivo, and Paps promoted Pablo, which is short for Paps Low. In 1921, a mere 300 gallons of near beer were produced, and the results were anything but appetizing. The taste for beverages such as Bevo dwindled and died. Whoever called it near beer was a poor judge of distance. Finally, on April 7, 1933, prohibition was repealed. President Roosevelt signed the 21st Amendment. So ended a 13-year alcohol drought. But it had taken its toll on the beer industry. About half of the nation's 1,500 small-town breweries had gone under. The ones that had been running on a shoestring and had uh, many repairs, uh, they simply closed their doors and they never reopened. Small-town breweries simply couldn't afford to reopen. They had gone broke in the decade of the 20s and simply didn't, didn't restart. Those that remain turned their sights to a new technology, the can. Actually, the technology for canning food had been around since the beginning of the 19th century, but the beer industry had a tough time adapting it to their product. They couldn't use the old-fashioned can that you might use for peas for beer. It was um, much more difficult because you would have to worry about the pressure being built, built up with the carbonation and whether it would explode the seams or not. And the taste was an even bigger bomb. If you tried to put beer into a can without lining it with some sort of a lacquer, you would have a can of beer that tasted like steel. 
Then in the 1930s, the canning industry came up with a solution. They used a heavier gauge of steel to make the cans and to counter the pressure. They also developed a wax coating which preserved the beer's taste. In 1935, the Kruger Brewing Company was the first to successfully put beer in a can. But it was World War II that made the beer can man's best friend. Most drinkers' introductions to cans came during World War II, uh, when the efficiencies of packing and shipping beer in can was uh, obvious to the U.S. Army. So a lot of GIs returning home had a fondness for cans, and, and cans really didn't start to take off until that time. And in 1962, the Pittsburgh Brewing Company's Iron City brand rolled out beer cans with a snap top, also known as the ring pull top. No opener needed. Lift the tab, pull back, and it's open. By the 1960s, the beer industry was clearly back on its feet, but it was about to get bigger than ever with the explosion of beer advertising. Anheuser-Busch, which uses rice in its Budweiser formula, buys about 15% of the total U.S. rice crop. 